So we are day two of Raisina Dialogues and we are going to be discussing a very interesting topic of mobilizing communities. We have here with us our Information and Broadcasting Minister Smriti Irani uh, and we have Yalda Hakim who has a very interesting background of reporting from conflict zone and of course uh, Karan Athaya who has again done enormous amount of work both reporting from the US uh, where there is an explosion of social movements currently uh, and hopefully we will talk about that as well. Uh, to kick off, I wanted to ask you uh, what, what role do you think the internet and social media platforms play in terms of government to citizen engagement and interactions and how do you see this communicative power being utilized by governments, particularly your government uh, and you personally in terms of engaging with constituents as well as fellow Indians? I think the Prime Minister set the tone for this engagement in the year 2013 when he was running for office. Uh, when social media per se was not looked upon as a tool for effective political communication, he said this is the future. And we have a lot of people now trying to do play catch up. But after coming into office, he uh, recognized the need to stay engaged with the constituencies, with the electorate, and even with those who have a voice, possibly never voted for us, but still want to connect with decision-making processes. And that is why for the first time in the history of our country, we had a platform called MyGov, which took birth. And the basic intention of my gov was that if there is an ministry which tries to make a particular policy, we invite public comments so that people at large, irrespective of their geographical challenges, can have a word put in about what they seek from a particular position of the government or, or, or from policy. That has been a very effective tool of communication. But we have ministers who have used it very well to even rescue people from distressing situations. Our Minister of External Affairs is known now world over, and especially uh, Indians are overjoyed that we have a minister that is available online whenever we are in trouble, that we can contact her and get lifted out of challenges. Um, I think that uh, as a female administrator, I also see the social media movement become a movement which uh, challenges uh, notions which are old, notions which stem from particular um, edifices in our democracy, where people can challenge earlier whatever some, let's say, a journalist said or whatever a policymaker said became that statement that nobody challenged, but conversation stemmed from it. Social media now has empowered the regular Joe or, or the regular citizen to say, no, I disagree, and challenge the very basis of a particular a statement, an ideology. And I think that is one of its biggest contributions in our democracy. The fact that people won't take just a statement or just a theory which is doled out to them, but they would challenge it with facts or very passionately speak about what they feel about a particular issue. So apart from administration, I think the, the sign of a healthy democracy is that the people to people connect, not only pertaining to your own geographical boundaries, but across the world on movements that matter to individuals. I think social media has played a vital role in that. Yeah, I think you're very right in terms of that. It has given a certain kind of centrality to people who have been at the edges and given them more voice. Um, coming to you, Yala, you've reported from conflict zones from Yemen to Libya and you've been there on the ground. It's one thing to sort of use it for governing and for engagement when you are in a predictable democracy, if I can call it a predictable democracy like us, but also when you take that to a conflict zone. How do you think communities are being mobilized when in a, in a conflict zone and particularly how do you deal with cohesion, bringing about cohesion in a conflict zone which you have experienced both from Afghanistan to Yemen and could you share some perspective on that? You know, I, I think um, I'll speak up on the point that the minister made about um, it gives voice to people who are, have been on the uh, peripheries or uh, movements that didn't have a voice before but I think what's more, more important than ever now for us is, as um, journalists, broadcasters, um, that we become forensic about our reporting um, so that, you know, um, we, 
we aren't sort of. It's important that we're challenged, and it's important that uh, our reporting is 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 looked at um, from a critical point of view. But um, it has become so important in this um, highly intense emotional climate that we have at the moment that our reporting is done in a factual, impartial, um, and and very forensic way that we look at things, you know, and we take a step back rather than get get caught in. In, to in terms of um, mobilizing communities, I mean, you just have to look at what's happened in the past few weeks um, in Iran, for example, yeah. that people were coming out onto the streets um, demonstrating um, about concerns, economic concerns that they had, um, uh, 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 you know, as far as the government was concerned. Um, coming out and protesting and they had been mobilized through social media. So they were using platforms like WhatsApp and Telegram, um, which was quite different to the Green Revolution of 2009. Um, they were using Twitter and Facebook and those uh, different platforms had gained some kind of traction. Um, whereas now they're using Telegram and, and WhatsApp to come together, to come out, to voice their concerns. How do you maintain cohesion? Well, I think one of the things that was raised from that was Will the government now crack down on these uh, these protesters? Um, the, the protests died down, um, but I think I think you know when you look at these um, communities, the the so-called so Arab Spring, for example, where I reported from extensively in Libya, in Tunisia, in Egypt, uh, people were coming. Uh, together to, to protest um, against uh, the governments that they had and various governments were toppled. But I think what's important is not just um, the mobilizing, but then what happens after. Are there institutions in place to ensure that the change that people want to bring are actually effective? Um, and sadly, in some parts of the world, we can see that they haven't been. Um, so it's, it's one thing that these platforms give voice and, and allow people to ask for reform, ask for change. Um, and then it's another uh, when we want to actually um, bring about real change. And that applies to some of the hashtags we've been speaking about, the hashtag MeToo, for example, yeah. Black Lives Matter. These things are campaigns that are built on social media. How do, then we, how do we then bring about real change on the ground from that? Yeah. And Karen, how do you see that playing out in the U.S.? Because U.S. currently is going through like major social mm -hmm. movements. They're not, you would say, creative disruption also. But how are you seeing that play out and the scale of it? I think what struck, strikes everybody is just a scale, whether there's a billion women marching, billion women marching, etc. Yeah, um, definitely. I mean, I think, um, just like Yalda said, some of the probably the most uh, salient and, and important conversations around race and gender seem to have bubbled up through social media. Now, granted, a lot of the issues that are being brought to the forefront were age-old issues, right? So Black Lives Matter um, challenging uh, police brutality and the disproportionate use of force against African Americans in the United States is an age-old problem, but what happened with social media, with people having mobile phones and able to take photos and videos and pictures of police brutality, um, it enabled uh, something that was old to become um, spread out. and it. it it sort of allowed for uh, a chance for justice. I think that's that that's that was the conversation. And so I think in the United States, and again with the Black Lives Matters um, um, movement, it became a national and even a presidential topic. I think without social media, I'm not sure we would have had that. It forced um, then candidate Hillary Clinton to address the issue. It forced Bernie Sanders to address the issue, and even to a certain extent, um, Trump. Um, so I think it, it, it does have that power, and again, with uh, communities, as Yalda said, that have traditionally been left out of mainstream media narratives, it does give that, um, that potential. But I think the, the danger in some ways, what we're seeing in the U.S., is um, the whole world watched what happened in, Char in Charlottesville. We had um, far-right neo-Nazi groups that were marching um, to support white supremacy, and I think when we talk about communities and community mobilization, especially from sort of the NGO world, we kind of tend to think of it as like, you know, this development, this sort of positive thing. And I think the other side of social media is what happens when com community mobilizing means far right, neo Nazi groups, white supremacist groups, hate groups. And I think that's what we're also struggling with is how do we, yes, maintain that space for positive community building, for freedom of speech, freedom of, of expression, but then also contain some of these, these toxic elements um, that are rising in our society as well. Yeah. And you have dealt with some of these issues yourself, both as part of your governing experience 
both as the MIB minister and also as an active campaigner, what different, I think there, what you say is right, because there is this, the, the platform is used for a variety of purposes. What in your experience, and what experience have you had in terms of using these tools, both for electioneering as well as for a cause? And I think Yalda talked about uh, journalists having the need to be more forensic. I think you have jumped in in a lot of conversations and created that competitive pressure on journalists to be a lot more forensic because you've checkpointed on errors or you've pointed out errors. So what has been your experience in terms of the quality of dialogue, both from the spectrum of election campaigning to leading to also checkpointing some corrective behaviors? I think that for a citizen to be empowered with the information in terms of availability of their public representatives is one of the biggest strong points of social media. The fact that it, through social media, a citizen can ask questions, ask for delivery on issues, and if these issues are not properly addressed, then can again and again mount that issue with a, a public representative is a very, very big plus for social media. The second aspect is that though everybody says that we're becoming shriller and there is a lot of negativity, the twofold impact I've seen of community mobilization. Uh, one, I have seen where people who do not have enough economic means to get health care, youngsters on social media come together, they provide for that money without going and asking the government for a dole. That I think shows a community spirit which is otherwise rarely visible because of all, like I said, our boundaries and the jurisdictional challenges and for that matter that you would never expect somebody sitting in Jammu Kashmir to connect with somebody sitting in Kanyakumari. So that is one, one big Thrust. But as somebody who's in the information broadcasting ministry, we've also had campaigns mounted uh, against, let's say, a television program where women have been objectified in not so uh, good a fashion. Either sexually explicit content is being shown, or um, or child marriage is being propagated to force a public opinion to be formed, so that through a democratic fashion, through rules and regulation and processes, we bring to stop such content. I have seen that as well. The consumer's power to unite on an issue. Has it happened? It has, has it happened. happened. It's happened in, in my jurisdiction. <laughs> I was very happy about it because here people were saying, I find this television content that is coming to my house 24-7, mm -hmm. a part of it uh, which is not uh, suitable for viewing of children and send a wrong message for girls. Uh, could you have it out of the context? They go through the regular processes of going to an independent media body. The independent media body then tells us that you should act upon this and seize uh, any kind of operation on this particular kind of content. And those things have happened, so I've seen that positive side. But as a female political activist, mm. it is often used to attack you in, in ways that you thought was uh, not only not healthy, but you never thought that a political opponent will use that as a tool to sexualize you so that's easy to target you. So you have faced both the good and the bad part. But I would rather turn towards the good sides and say that I can take the flag and I can take the fire because the good uh, that the social media could do actually outweighs a lot of the bad that happens. But the, the, um, the position that Yala has taken is actually correct. That when you talk about changing uh, an administrative or power structure, what is that institution that ensures that the transition is smooth and the transition is in conformity to the desires of those who are petitioning or the desire of those? Uh, I think that it's all at a nascent stage mm -hmm. because all those gaps uh, are actually filled by another political entity or group. Mm -hmm. And when people get, uh, I, uh, there's an Urdu word for it, bezar, when they, when they want to wean off Sick it, of it mm -hmm. yes, yeah. they think that nothing works. Mm -hmm. I think that for me is the danger, yeah. Yeah. where they feel that even the answer the that they were lose. looking at actually didn't materialize mm -hmm. as well as they hoped for. Mm -hmm. And for them to then lose trust in the mm -hmm. system mm -hmm. per se is what is more dangerous. Mm -hmm. So I would rather have people saying that I will continue to address these issues, continue to have hope that there will be a solution and not lose faith when you think that you replaced A with B and B is doing no better. Mm -hmm. I think that you have to give hope a chance. You have to give the system a chance because ultimately we have to be part of a structured system to bring about that change. Mm -hmm. And many a times, as, as very rightly said by Karen, there are many old issues mm -hmm. which are looking at new justice. Mm -hmm. yes. So uh, I think that is what social media drives. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
the fact that it empowers you individually to be a part of justice, mm -hmm. I think it's one of the biggest blessings that social media brings to you. And I agree, that is that is sort of the difficulty with it because it's so instant and because it's so easy to send a tweet or to organize a, a sort of a hashtag. We expect microwave yeah. changes. Yeah. And so when that doesn't happen, and um, I think in the US, when we see that it's harshest because there are a lot of people who don't even understand our own laws, who don't understand how the government works, who's responsible for making change, so they don't understand what happens when, um, for instance, the verdict, a verdict on a case doesn't come back the way it should. And yeah. It was, I think that that is part of the frustration that government I, but I think still it's needs a to catch opportunity. up. Yeah, it's true. If you've identified where the frustration stems mm -hmm. from, it's an opportunity for us then to educate mm -hmm. and create that a public debate. Yes, right. create a particular uh, uh, kind of an ecosystem which educates you mm -hmm. that this is your expectation, it will be fulfilled from this quarter, mm -hmm. so that your angst is not misdirected, right. yeah. or the kind of relief you expect from the system is not miscommunicated. Mm -hmm. So I think those are the gaps which are now getting identified, and those are the gaps that we need to fill with new knowledge or new information. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right, and I think what the panel discussed here is that there's, there is, of course, the scale effect which social media platforms provide, and of course, as a platform, Facebook does certainly provide but there's also this huge need in terms of institutional practices, which is a bridge building effort that you talked about, that how do you take a theme like a meme and translate that into something which is tangible, which can only come through institutions, uh, institutional reform and institutions existing, could be a political party, which you talked about. Uh, and that kind of a position is a better situation to be in rather than civic apathy, which was your concern, that civic Apathy is more dangerous than all the all the other stuff which we are seeing playing out. So we've had a very energetic conversation on day two of Rysina. Uh, keep tuned in to watch more and see more. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. so much. Thank you.